Well, you know, talking about the unforeseen, I mean, just, I mean, you came out of live television, you did documentaries, and there was an apprenticeship that preceded this, you know, I mean, you worked with everybody from Sonny and Cher to Harold Pinter, but this basically was the film that Opus One, it identifies a lot of your themes, it's, it's, it's a key achievement, and I'm wondering, how much, did you have to fight to get this thing made? What, what kind of, I mean, you had a best-selling book, you know, the, um, to base it on, but it said, from what I understand, you actually have to do a lot of your own research to really get it right on your own terms. Well, I never re read the book. The book was by Robert Moore, who had written The Green Berets. I never read the book. I started to, and I found it a, a little bit flat and sort of factual. <laughs> but it wasn't until I met Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso, the two actual cops who made this case, that I felt there was really a story there. Then it took the producer and myself over two years to get it made. It was turned down by every studio in town at least twice. And uh, Fox finally made it. Dick Zanuck was head of Fox and he said, uh, one day he said, uh, look, uh, I don't know, if you can make that picture for a million five, he said, I've got a million five hidden away in a drawer over here. <laughs> he said, and I, I'm going to be fired before you finish it. So if you can get this thing cast and made, go ahead. And uh, we had a budget at the time of three million dollars. But we had uh, visions of getting someone like Paul Newman to play the lead. And Zanuck said, you don't, you're not going to get Paul Newman. He said, he... Paul Newman was one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood then. He was getting 500000 a picture. And he said, that's a third of the budget I'm giving you. So you're not going to get Paul Newman. Just get a very good actor and go make the picture. And so we wound up making it for a million eight. And uh, I went $300,000 over budget. And there wasn't one day that they didn't want to fire me. <laughs> in fact, you know, they often... The guys who were running the studio then would call Phil D'Antoni, my producer, and they'd say, are you guys finished yet? Are you done with that picture? And he'd say, no, we got a couple of more days, Stan. And he'd say, a couple of more days? He said, if that son of a bitch isn't finished by Thursday, tell him he's through. He's fired. He's out of here. And D'Antoni would just hang up the phone. See, basically, I mean, oh, the, you come out... Hang on just a second. I'm so it's a French connection. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm your moment. It's just so burning with questions. Yeah. Basically, you you were working with hidden cameras in the street, as I understand. I mean, is that how you got this made? You know, just to get the well, streets we didn't and didn't really hide cameras. We just went out on the streets of New York before that was a common thing to do, mm. and we had handheld cameras. The camera operator was a guy called Ricky Bravo. Mm -hmm. And Ricky uh, had photographed the Cuban Revolution at Castro's side. Uh, he was in the Sierra Maestre Mountains with Castro and, and filmed the entire Cuban Revolution right down to the taking of Havana. Mm -hmm. And then he became disillusioned with Castro and he moved to Miami and then he came to New York and Owen Roisman, whose first film this was as a director of photography, knew him and he hired him. And Ricky could do anything with a camera. Mm. And we, we didn't have things like dolly tracks. or There was no such thing as a steady cam. You all know what that is. Uh, Ricky could hand hold. And, uh, and I was prepared, since I had done that myself when I made documentaries, I was prepared to live with a handheld feeling to the picture. And a lot of times, though, Ricky, believe it or not, I look at a lot of this stuff and it, it looks like shaky cam. You know? uh, and, but I remember uh, Ricky was a perfectionist and he used to say to me, no, no, he, he wore an eye patch and uh, he had one good eye which he used to look through the viewfinder. And he used to say to me sometimes, no, no, senor, that, that was no good. And I said, him, I said, Ricky, don't ever cut, don't ever cut unless I say cut. Because there'll be stuff there that you think looks no good that I'm going to like. He said, okay. And so then we went and we shot that scene where uh, the two cops are asking their supervisor for permission to wiretap. Right. And the way I used to work is I would tell Owen Reisman what my staging was. He would light the set. 
with very small lights. We just bounce lights into the ceiling. There were no key lights. There were no sets. Everything was on location. And Owen would bounce some lights uh, so that the whole set was lit. And, uh, and I wouldn't tell Ricky what was going to happen in the scene. I would just say to Ricky, you know, three guys are going to be moving around the scene. Find it. Just find the scene. <laughs> so we went out and we did a take that way. And I think the take took about three or four minutes, which is a lot of time. And uh, at the end of it, I said, how was it, Ricky? And he lifted up his eye patch and he said, completely blocked. Everything. I don't see anything. Everything blocked. I said, why didn't you cut? He said, you told me not to cut. <laughs> so we had to do another take. But, uh, the reason the film looks like it does is because of the, this guy. He was just a great documentary yeah. camera operator. Yeah. He, was, he, he passed away. He was a, a master, and I, I did about four or five films with him. Music is so important in all your films, as we know. I mean, each, each film has a kind of musical identity. Here you got the terrific music. And I'm just wondering, how do you, um, planning the rhythms, I mean, you don't plan the rhythms, but it, it seems that it's very important to you just in terms of finding a film. I mean, are you listening to a lot of music when you're making a picture? Or how did you come to across the music for this? Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time, but I used to go, there used to be a nightclub on Melrose. It was called Nucleus Nuance. Mm. And it later became a health food restaurant, which many of you may remember as a health food restaurant. But it was a big, you know, it's a room this big, and it was like a nightclub. And on Monday nights, there was a 50-piece band in there, uh, led by a guy named Don Ellis. And uh, it was called a rehearsal band so they didn't have to pay the musicians. And all these musicians just got together because they wanted to play this kind of far out music. And the, everything was electric. Mm. Electric drums, electric brass, electric strings. And the only other electric music I was hearing then was from Miles Davis and then Don Ellis. And then a lot of people may recall that when Bob Dylan went electric and, and he was denounced by the folk music. Right. But this was all electronic music. Where Ellis was a great young trumpeter and they used to play over their own echo. They would play chords and stuff and you would hear an echo out there and then they'd play over the echo. And I used to go in every Monday night and hear this band. And when the French Connection came along, I, I went over to Don Ellis and introduced myself and I said, uh, I'd love to have you score a movie for me, which he had never <coughs> done. And uh, so he came in and, and did the score. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, Don, think about doing, you know, not so much the big brassy sound that you usually have, but more of a string sound. And that's all I told him. Uh, everything else was his. That was his first score. And what did the studio make of it? I mean, you turned in this high-energy movie. Did they, did they get behind it? Or? No, they, it was released in many places as a double feature. It was on okay. 42nd Street as a double feature. They had no idea what they had. Uh, neither did I. I didn't know what it was. I still, I, to this day, I think it's a you know, nice little B picture. <laughs> Honestly, and uh, but they had no idea. They put nothing behind it, and then all of it, it just took off. Mm -hmm. From the day it opened, it took off like a drum beat across the country. <clears throat> the Gene was not a star. The yeah. other guys were completely unknown. Uh, I had just made boys in the band, and so you know, no one was looking for an action picture for me. Uh, so, well, not that kind of action. <laughs> but, uh, say what? Thanks, Mom. <laughs> uh, 